This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hi, welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Laura Lotka, and I'm here with my co-host, Renee Williams. Today in studio, we have a few guests with us, and we'll um, talk to both of them. We have Dr. Ellen Crocker and Dr. Carmen Agaritas. Um, first, I'll introduce Dr. Crocker, and she works um, when in our um, Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and she specializes in forest health issues, and she also works with the Forest Health Center, that's housed here at the University of Kentucky. And then we also have um, Dr. Carmen Agaritas, and she is an Extension Associate Professor in Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering here in the College of the Agriculture and Food and Environment. So it's a pleasure to have you both in studio today. And um, today we're going to be talking about citizen science. And before we get started in talking about citizen science, tell our listeners um, what both of y'all do at UK. Great. Well, thanks for having us on today. Um, as you mentioned, I work with Extension and I work with the Forest Health Center. And in both of those capacities, I lead a lot of education and outreach efforts. And through that role, I've been involved in research collaborations with biological and social scientists and citizen scientists in a variety of different projects, uh, one of which I'll be talking about a little bit today, Tree Snap. Um, but I think citizen science is a great way as an educator to engage the people that I'm working with, to train people, to get them um, involved in issues that they care about and kind of uh, give them a voice in the research that's happening. Um, as a scientist, it's also a great way to get more information from different people. So there's a lot of different reasons why I think citizen science is exciting. Hi, um, I work in primarily ecosystem restoration at UK, and that means I look at streams that are impacted, whether that be in urban landscapes, um, agricultural ones, or even mining, and look at how we can bring those um, back to a more functioning state. I also do a lot of work with stormwater management, um, but related to what we're talking about today is I do a lot with STEM and environmental education, and through that role, I interact with the community, um, largely with lately high school students, and helping them to come up with projects that they can investigate around in our community. So it's uh, their type of experiential or experimental uh, citizen science. I also work with the new Kentucky Master Naturalist Program, and citizen science we believe is very important, which is why that's a specific area that we focus on in that program, um, so we can get people involved in a variety of different levels of citizen science from inventorying what might be out around in their community, um, doing monitoring all the way to designing and carrying out their own experiments. Okay, great. So tell us, what is citizen science? So you've mentioned that term a lot. Can you define it for us? Yeah, it's a tricky term because it's really broad and it covers a lot of ground. But in general, when people talk about citizen science, what they're talking about is non-professional scientists conducting real scientific research. And I think it's rooted in the idea that you don't have to be a faculty or have a science degree to contribute a lot. Um, this could be done in collaboration with professional scientists, or it could be, um, you know, you pursuing something that you're interested in doing science yourself. So it's a really broad term that covers many different types of projects. It could be people collecting data. It could be analyzing data, um, playing a central role in a project, or even just spending a few minutes scanning through images on your phone or computer. So donating your time, your resources to science in some way. So why would you say that citizen science is important? I think that it kind of bridges the gap between professional scientists and our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Because okay. for most people, they might not be, you know, the first thing they think of. But, you know, they are engaging with science all the time. And there are ways that they can be using scientists, uh, science to benefit their lives. And I think a lot of times we create this false divide between, you know, the professional scientists mm -hmm. and then everybody else. And I think citizen science is a good way to... Um, 
to merge those two and to help you realize that you don't have to be a paid scientist to be using science to answer your questions, to be contributing to science um, in a meaningful way. Now, I think the other thing citizen science does is it helps us better evaluate information that we receive. It, if we understand how science or information and knowledge is made, generated, then I think we are better consumers of that product and, 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 inform, and we make better informed decisions off of that. So how would you say that uh, citizen science helps researchers? Well, I think one of the reasons researchers are so interested in citizen science is that you know, there's only so many researchers out there, and mm -hmm. all of them have slim budgets that are always getting slimmer. Um, and citizen science is a way for them to maybe collect or analyze more data from more people, different types of people, because as professional scientists, you know, we're going to have our own little bent on the world and the way that we see things. And citizen science not only increases the amount of data that's coming in, uh, the scope of the work that you can do, it could increase the different kind of types of data you're getting, where it's coming from, who's contributing it, um, all sorts of different things. Beyond that, I think you have the ability, as uh, Carmen said, to connect to people, to engage them in what you're doing and why it's important, uh, to really involve people in the work that you do, um, what you care about, uh, connecting those dots on why it's meaningful and how it has the potential to impact them. So what makes a person a good citizen scientist then? It's a great question. <laughs> um, the first thing I look for is curiosity. Mm -hmm. and, and while that is sometimes debated is that a trainable skill, I think in a way it is. Um, we're, we're naturally born curious creatures. We want to know answers to things. You think about um, from when you were a little child, you're always touching and experimenting and you're learning from that. And to me, that's the great foundation is, is what's that curiosity, curiosity and passion you have. The other thing I think is important is being very detail oriented. Um, and you can learn that. Uh, and, and speaking of somebody who's married to someone who's not always detail oriented, I know that it's something that, that can be learned. But when we do science, it's really important that we pay particular attention to those observations and record information down. Um, another thing that's really important is we record all that information, right? We may get a data point that doesn't uh, confirm with maybe our pre preconceived beliefs, so I think it's important to be open-minded when you go into science um, and just being willing to learn. I think that's another important part of it as well, being um, willing to ask more questions because you'll learn the more you do science and we answer one question, there's probably 10 more questions that pop up in its place. I think that's a really good point in that science is not kind of a set in stone uh, thing. It's a process and it's engaging in that process. And the discovery of new questions, I think for every question you answer, there's going to be many more questions that mm -hmm. come up. And I know later we're going to be talking about um, in detail some projects that people can get involved with. But just in general, what, what are some examples of citizen science projects? So I think it could be all sorts of different things. So it could be anything from participating in what's called a bio blitz at your local park, where people try to identify all of the different species they can in some you know a day or a set period of time just to see what's the biodiversity that's there and um, appreciating that, but also keeping a record of it, to being involved in a research project, uh, contributing to something that maybe thousands of other people across the country are also you know, observing and adding their data to, to build this really big data set for how things are changing or what's happening with a particular species. Or it could be, you know, there's some, some issue that you care about in your local area, maybe water quality or something else that you want to know more about, you want to get information on, and you want to raise awareness about. So it really spans a lot of ground there um, as far as, you know, what types of projects mm -hmm. it could be. Good. And so you've mentioned some great things um, about citizen science. What are some of the challenges with it? Wow. Um, I think one of the first challenges from a researcher standpoint is when we get data in, we have to be able to trust it, mm -hmm. um, especially if we're going to be using that data uh, to make bigger decisions. We need to look at it from that standpoint. 
The other aspect of it is the precision. So a lot of times Ellen mentioned like sampling water quality, for instance. So uh, in Kentucky, the Kentucky Watershed Watch is a program that a lot of individuals can go through and get training on and they can uh, pick a water body like a stream or a lake or whatever that they're interested in and start to sample from. Well, those are kits that are going to have a certain level of precision. So for instance, they measure, may measure down to parts per million. Um, when we get into the laboratory, with some of the scientific equipment we may have, say at the University of Kentucky, we can be much more precise, maybe get down to parts per billion. So there may be some limits to what that is. Some of the projects that I've worked with, with students where they've gone out and done them, that's usually one of the biggest limitations we run across. It's a great screening tool for what we have, but it may not be something that we can make, say, really large policy changing decisions on. It, it usually gives us a first step. So I would say that's one of the challenges. Um, the other may be training. So Ellen mentioned different levels of projects you can get mm -hmm. into. So some may be like using an app where you can enter in bits of information. You might need a ruler for it or just observations you see. Uh, and that takes one level, right? But another one may be like the water test kit. So you may have to go through multi days of training to get what that is. Um, and then some of it may be experiments where you have to have a long amount of time. And so time may also be a limitation for some individuals that say, I can go dedicate a couple hours a day, but maybe I cannot dedicate, you know, going out to the same site once a month for multiple years. Hmm. Good. Yeah, I think citizen science should be fun. It should be rewarding. It should you know, teach you some new things and maybe connect you to new people. So engaging in citizen science um, as a citizen scientist should be a really positive uh, process. And um, sometimes I think projects can either fall short on the um, kind of educational side or maybe on the research side. So maybe it's really fun and you learn a lot but the research isn't you know, going anywhere or meaningfully contributing. Uh, other times the research might be really important, but it might not be something you wanna do with your Saturday afternoon. And so I think finding the right balance between those is, is another challenge. The other thing I would say is if you are involved in a citizen science project, is to understand the big picture of where you connect in, and that may help you um, be a little bit more passionate or interested in that project. So if you're doing collecting data, for instance, like for a stream and you want to assess it, it helps to know what that data may be used for, what's the bigger picture, that bigger question that may be answered. So if you do get involved with that, um, I would encourage anybody to say, why are we collecting this data? How's it going to be used? You know, what's the meaning of what I'm doing? Do a lot of uh, citizen science projects have a training for people that want to participate in it? I think it totally depends on the project. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be all across the board. So the training might be as much as, you know, uh, a couple lines of text, here's what you do, have fun, mm -hmm. or it might be a multi-day process. So it just depends. And so if you're somebody who's interested in this and you're thinking, oh, I don't have enough time to contribute to this, uh, don't think that because there are some projects you can just go to the website and spend five minutes and you can be part of something that, you know, is doing important work. At the same time, if this is something that you're really passionate about and um, this this is, you know, your hobby, what you like doing in your spare time. There's a lot of options for kind of that next level, that really more involved um, uh, researcher uh, that, that you could become and you could be um, contributing data. Okay, so tell us a little bit how maybe teachers or high school students can get involved in citizen science. I know there's kind of um, two spectrums of it, one where they develop the whole project themselves and other where they um, kind of go into something that's already established and created. So can you tell us kind of on that other end of the spectrum where the students or the teachers work together and develop their own citizen science project? I tend to work more with um, high school students when it comes to citizen science, sometimes with the community. But when a high school student comes to me, usually the first thing I ask them is, what are you interested in? Uh, because if they're going to take on this project, if they're going to put the amount of time and investment that's going to require to do more of an experimental type of project, they need to pick something they really like. So that's usually where we start out with. Um, the next thing I usually ask them is, what have they noticed that they have a question about? And that usually is a conversation we'll have back and forth. And usually I find that if they have a question, um, that they one might not be the only one. So they'll go and kind of research that question to see if anybody's done anything before. Um, but the other is I really try to encourage them to say, 
if you answer this question, what kind of positive impact could it have on your community? And usually if I can tie it into their local community, that helps them better because it's a, it's a place based, right? That they know that community. Um, once they kind of get that part of it down in the question, then we'll start talking about what resources might be available for them. Um, you don't want to design a project that's going to require an electron microscope <laughs> and you have no access to it. So we try to find things that um, are available for them on the web that they can get free download or um, are going to be very low cost if they, they have to go into it. So that's usually one of the budgetary constraints. And then from that standpoint, we really um, start to design a timeline, like where were they going, what are they going to collect, how are they going to do that. And so a lot of times for me, it's asking questions. And I really don't want the project to be something I totally design. I'd rather it be them starting to come up with some ideas about what it may be. Um, and then also I want them to think in the beginning of how they're going to communicate the results that they get. And I think that's going to be an important process because when I deal with high school students, I look at this as a gateway to higher education also for them. And I want them to start to be get familiar with that um, scientific process. And while we may hear about it, it's the more you do it, the more you repeat it like anything and you practice it, you get better at it. And so in the end, we also usually try to identify that, oh, this is when you expect to be done. Um, how are we going to do those results? So I'll give you an example of a project that, that I uh, completed lately with a high school student from Lafayette High School. Um, uh, her name was Erin Rimley, and she came to me with an interest in stream restoration. So that's something I do. She also had an interest in aquatic macroinvertebrates, so basically the bugs that live in the stream. And the other thing she was noticing, um, partly because her father works at Third Rock, was the number of stream restoration projects that were done around in Fayette County. And so some of the projects were older and some of the projects were newer. And the other thing, um, when we say stream restoration, we're talking with her, was also she was thinking everything from where we actually get in and we get the uh, excavators out and we redesign a whole new channel we we dig it up and put it back down all the way to a neighborhood came in and planted native plants along riparian buffer so it was pretty broad in what we were calling stream restoration you've been listening to from the woods kentucky with co-hosts renee and laura we'll be right back after this short break Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. For those of you who may be just joining us, each week towards the beginning of the show, we will play a wildlife sound from the forest. So here's our sound for today. Stay tuned. Towards the end of the show, we will tell you what this animal is and why it makes this sound. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. The other question that we were kind of looking at was, did it matter in an urban area? Could we make that biological habitat better? So when you get into an urban environment, one of the things that you focus on with streams a lot of times is making what we call stable. So we don't want them to really erode. We don't want these really steep incised banks and things mm -hmm. like that. As we've progressed, we start to really look also at water quality. So can we improve the water that's already in the stream? And we also look at habitat. So the critters that are living in the water can we make the habitat better for them so we get um, critters that are going to do better for the food chain, right? And so some of those aspects of it. So what Aaron did was um, we went and used two things that are available on the web. One of them was a rapid bioassessment protocol. So it's a protocol developed by the Environmental Protection Agency. And that protocol really looks at stream habitat and says, can I come up with a number that tells me if my habitat might be poor, might be fair, might be good for the area I'm in. And it looks at everything from um, the amount of sediment that's deposited in the stream to the type of vegetation on the banks, how wide it is, a variety of different things. And so we downloaded that. Erin um, 
read through kind of the manual that goes with it. So it's a little bit more technical with that. And then I went out into the field with her and we went to a stream that was on campus and kind of walked through what each of those things mean. Mm -hmm. And then I had her score it and just say, what does she come up with? And then we would kind of talk it through. Um, also because she's a minor, then I would have my graduate students go with her at different places in the field. Um, and she went around to a variety of different streams in Fayette County and a couple in Franklin and also Clark looking at different projects. And these projects were some that were, you know, maybe a few months old all the way to some that were 10 years old. And some were for intermittent streams, which meant they only flow seasonally. So think like in the winter and the spring when there's the groundwater tables pretty high and to ones that flow all year round. And she would go through and score, you know, what, what was that RBP in the end, take a lot of photos of it as well. Springtime comes around, and that's when we like to get outside and start sampling for the bugs in the water. Mm -hmm. And the bugs tell us something about the water quality. So they're not all the same. Um, some bugs are very sensitive to poor water quality, and they will die off. And others are really, really hardy, and they can live through <laughs> about anything. So what she would do was go out and sample these different streams and count how many bugs that she find and what kind. And what that does is it comes up to something called a biotic index. And you can find that on Kentucky Watershed Watch. They have a little calculation sheet you can go through and she would sample and do that. Now this sheet is great for getting a rough assessment. So when we talk about precision, it's not very precise. If you mm -hmm. talk to a biologist that does this, they're gonna to wanna to pull all this stuff under the microscope and really get specific with it, but it's great for screening. What I was really impressed with the project is Erin, uh, she collects all this data and it took multiple months for her to do this. And then she would come back into the office and we talk about what she found. Okay, so as she's doing it, we talk about, okay, what are you seeing and things like that. But before we even crunch the numbers, I want her to tell me based on just what she's seeing in the field, what does she think the number's gonna say? Because I'm really big on, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. um, because if we just use a calculator or anything like that and it spits out a number, it's a number. But we have to interpret that number and say, does it really make sense? So when she did that, we went through and did some statistics then we had to say, okay, what does it mean? What's the information that's gonna be helpful for this? So if I went to um, the engineers and the policymakers in the city of Lexington and said, this is what we're seeing, what does you tell them? What was cool about it, or I found was really interesting and I, that she came up with was some information, for example, like on intermittent streams. So we saw streams that, um, where they went in and you know took the excavator in, re totally designed it, moved around, and also ones where they just planted along and, and made a good riparian buffer or wide once there was good tall vegetation, shaded the, tree, the stream and so forth. There wasn't really much difference in that. And that told us that, well, maybe we shouldn't spend a whole lot of money, potentially, mm -hmm. on doing a big full-scale restoration project on an intermittent stream. Maybe we can get the same amount of impact by just planting a really good riparian buffer. So that was one thing we looked at. Um, so the other thing that was really cool was on that RBP score, she has all these little things she's measuring, right? And she looked at each of those little individual parameters. And what's great for a designer then is she can go back and say the streams that look like they had the best biologic activity had these kind of characteristics and the ones that looked poor looked like this was a problem. And one of those might be sediment deposition. So it might be the amount of sediment that might be filling in certain places. And so that could tell a designer that maybe we need to do a little bit more on the erosion control, maybe um, getting that vegetation established really quickly was really important. So there's certain things that we can take from that and then go back to designers and say, this is how you're designing this stream. And it's maybe great for doing say water quality or this, but maybe not so much robotic habitat. So then you can start looking at goals and weighing that trade off from it. And it starts bringing in more and more questions. What was also good about this was that Aaron took all this information and put it into a poster. And she hmm. actually then had to present it twice. So one was during the fall when she had her first set of results. And then the next part would be in the spring when she had her second set. So she actually entered into uh, the sustainability forum that's done here at UK and actually placed second in the undergraduate category for what she did. So part of that was, can I write out my results? And then can I communicate them to an audience who may not know a lot about the topic I looked into and help them understand and interpret the results? Wow, it's really clear that, you know, this, in this case, like using citizen science was an amazing educational tool. Mm -hmm. and, and what's nice about this is it was also a gateway into higher ed. So we're very happy in our department because Erin joined the biosystems engineering department and she's now a freshman in our department. That's great.
Okay, so we were just talking about kind of that, that one end of the spectrum where you're designing and developing an entire project. Um, but now let's talk about the other end of the spectrum where you can kind of get involved with kind of already established projects that may be um, a little bit easier for people that may not have as much time to get involved with. And um, joining us now in studio, we have Lori Thomas along with um, Dr. Ellen Crocker here. And so can you tell us a little bit about some of those other projects that um, kind of are already established that you can get involved with pretty quickly? Right. So citizen science might be kind of a new term, but non-professional scientists have been involved in research for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the best examples of a long running citizen science program is um, bird watching and everything having to do with birds. Yes, I would agree. Mm -hmm. So there's programs that have been running for like a hundred years, but wow. in the past you know, decade or two, the increased use of apps and the internet has just been a game changer. So whereas previously you might have had to submit a paper form on something, right. mm -hmm. now you just click your phone. Yeah, touch of the finger, there it is, <laughs> right. Said. So Lori, I know that you were involved in some of those projects and leading some work with them. <laughs> Do you have any you can talk about? Yeah, um, and, and you know, you talk about birds, and a lot of this does come about. Um, one that we'll talk about later is the Christmas bird count. Um, it's been around for well over 100 years. Great example of citizen science. Again, paper, today it's all technology, it's all on your phone. But um, for birding, there is, there's a lot of different citizen science programs, and kind of the big one um, is eBird. And eBird is basically, you can count birds anytime, anywhere. Um, this is a worldwide type of uh, citizen science program. The estimated 100 million bird sightings are submitted each year. And I'm wow. sure those numbers have exploded since the advent of technology. I mean, it's an app. You can just download it on your phone. <laughs> it's so easy. Um, but it's a, it's a great uh, citizen science program for the beginners and the people who are really into birding. That's kind of how I got started when I first started birding. I started doing e-birding, writing down my stuff, and then going to the computer and putting it in. And now I, I use it on my phone. And you said it's for any bird. Yes. It doesn't any matter bird. what bird it is. No, this is out in nature. You okay. are counting birds anytime, anywhere. So okay. it's great. It's free, too. And all of this information goes back to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, kind of the clearinghouse. Keeps track of species abundance, you know, migratory patterns. You know, this is, this is stuff that... You know, the hundreds or maybe thousands of uh, ornithologists we have out there couldn't begin to collect this kind of data. Yeah, and there are mm -hmm. hundreds of research articles, yes. you know, peer-reviewed research articles using that data. Exactly. So it's, you know, directly pipelined into uh, scientific research. Exactly, it is. So it's not just a for funds. Mm -hmm. It's it's definitely science-based. Um, and then, like we said, there's the Christmas bird count. We'll talk more about that. Um, but uh, there's Project Feeder Watch, which we discussed in an earlier program, and that is looking, watching those birds that come to your feeders. And this is a wintertime program, November to April. Great, you know, great source of science to collect information on how our migratory patterns may be changing for some of these birds as we see changes in our climate and whatnot. So it's a, another, uh, that one's not a free program, but it's a nominal $15 to join up for that citizen science program. And you don't have to leave your house. You can just <laughs> sit there and watch the birds out at your bird feeder. Um, another one that I participate in is the Great Backyard Bird Count. A lot of our parks and stuff do that one. That's going to be in February 15th through the 18th of 2019. And that's really just let's get out. We're just starting to see birds kind of maybe moving back and starting to move, make some small steps back towards their breeding ground. So we're just out there to get a good count in that one weekend. Um, so that's a great program free. Also, you can find information about it as well at Cornell Lab and Lab of Ornithology. There's Project Nest Watch. Just like it sounds, you're going to watch nest, and this one's going to happen in the you know during nesting season for birds. This one's really an important one, and a lot of people have started participating more in this. It's kind of new, um, and it's also by Cornell Lab of Ornithology, but it's telling us a lot about where birds are nesting and how successful they're nesting. Because mm -hmm. as we see changes in our environment, we see. You know, I mean, things are, are changing. We've got more human development. We're mm -hmm. we're starting. We see some impacts on that, and so this is a good project, citizen science project, to keep track of that. And then there's also for those who love hummingbirds, and <laughs> um, there are hummingbirds at home. And this one's run by the Audubon Society. 
And it's a great one. Again, you're watching your hummingbird feeders outside your home, helping provide this information about where, depending on your location, which hummingbirds you're seeing, and if that's changing from year to year. So those are a couple of really good bird-based ones. There's a lot of other ones that I know that Dr. Crocker's Ellen's going to talk about as well, too. Yeah. So. so we can't talk citizen science without talking about iNaturalists. Oh, I yes. Think. <laughs> if we're talking about technology and citizen yes. science. It's great. It's great. And it's one of my favorites. So I share it with everyone because it's kind of got two roles in my mind. First, it's a great way to contribute to citizen science, mm -hmm. to be part of a bigger community, but it's also a great tool. So if you don't know about iNaturalist, it's a iPhone app that you can mm -hmm. download. It's also got a website with kind of, it's like Facebook for naturalists. Right. Mm -hmm. People create observations, so they take pictures of different things. It could be a tree, it could be an animal, it could be an insect, mm -hmm. um, whatever. And then they'll um, add them to this you know, huge global database of different organisms that people are observing. And um, that can be used by scientists. Mm -hmm. It could be used for an educational purpose, or if you want to have a bio blitz and collect biodiversity data for some park or area that you're working with. Which I know a lot of parks have been doing that. It's an educational program because it's going to help you, The as, as Ellen said, it is a tool. It helps you identify what you've taken a picture of in case you're not sure, you know. And that's my favorite <laughs> right. part of iNaturalist. But the, and, then, yeah. and then they collect all this data. I know we did it in parks too. So it was a lot of fun. You got out, you used technology, but they also, while these people were doing a program, they're going to tell you what they're finding out mm -hmm. in your park, which yeah. is great. And iNaturalist helps you out with that because it's got a couple different levels. We were talking earlier about how important it is to um, be precise with your data and have data that you're confident about for scientific research. iNaturalist does that in a few different ways. And one is that they have a computer algorithm in it that if you take a picture of something, it'll match that image to their database of millions of images mm -hmm. and tell you what it thinks it is, which is great for identifying plants that you might not be familiar with. It's not always right, but it gives you some good It'll give you some points. options, yeah. which is what I like. We were, um, I know we were doing a botany program over at the Arboretum, and it's a big class, and you know, you've got so many books you can look at. And so we showed them how to use iNaturalist, and it gave them a listing you know, that was ironweed they took a picture of, a list of 10, and they were able to zero in, yet yeah, this is the right plant. Mm -hmm. So it was great. It was yeah. very helpful with a big group. So. so give it a try. And there's even a version called Seek that if you're working with youth, they don't have to make an account. It just kind of will identify things they take a picture of. But for if you, if you really want to kind of go the next step and you contribute online with your iNaturalist account, not only will you get it telling you what it thinks it is, you know, based on their system, but you'll have all of the millions of iNaturalist users, or, uh, you know, <laughs> thousands, who will tell you, no, I think it's this, or yes, I agree. Um, so they kind of moderate too. Uh, so iNaturalist is a great tool, but it's also a great way to be a part of um, citizen science and to join this bigger naturalist community. Right. Mm -hmm. Another app that, that I'd like to tell you about is TreeSnap, and that's one that myself and some colleagues um, here with the Forest Health Research and Education Center, University of Kentucky, University of Tennessee, developed. And the whole idea with TreeSnap um, is really how do we put scientists in touch with citizen scientists to help collect data about trees. And so most of the scientists that we work with were looking at trees that have been just wiped out by invasive insects and diseases. So things like American chestnut. American chestnut used to be a quarter of the trees in the Appalachians, and then an invasive fungus came in and wiped it out. But there are scientists that are trying to bring it back. And there are groups like the American Chestnut Foundation that are looking for American chestnuts. They want to see them out in nature. They want to see if there are any healthy ones. Um, where are they? Uh, so they can add them to their research programs. So TreeSnap is a way to connect them to people who might be hiking around, might see these trees, might have them on their property. And not just the American Chestnut Foundation and Chestnut, but similar programs with ash, with elm, with um, many different trees uh, across the United States. And so the whole point of TreeSnap is to make it as easy as possible to contribute data to these scientific research um, programs. And it's a free app. You can download it for your iPhone or your Android device. Um, there's a website where you can keep track of your data, share it with scientists, um, maybe even communicate with them about what you've been seeing. So that's another option that's out there and would be a great project for anybody who's really enthusiastic about different tree species, um, 
our native tree species and healthy forests. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What are some other projects you can think of? Um, well, there's one that uh, we had participated in at one point in time, big, the uh, Big Butterfly Count, which I know Flora Cliff also, which is one of our um, nature preserves here right on the fringes of Fayette County, uh, participates in this. And of course, you're out counting butterflies, so you're going to do it in the summer. Um, it, that the Butterfly Count uh, is put on by the Butterfly Conservation Network, and it runs July 20th through August 12th, you know, when butterflies are up and about. So that one's a really... I think a, a good one, it's it's a fun one. Um, you're going to be out in the open. You're not so much in the woods. You're going to be out looking in the fields. Um, they said last year in 2018, over 100,000 people took part in the Big Butterfly Count. So I wow. think that's pretty great. And it's providing a great assessment tool or assesses the health of our environment. Mm -hmm. You know, as we've seen, you know, encroaching and whatnot into nature. Another one is Project Bud Burst. Um, and that's uh, run by the Chicago Botanical Garden. And it's uh, looking at the science of phenology. Uh, so you bring together your, of course, your researchers, your educators, and your citizen sciences, scientists to um, uncover the stories of plants that have been affected by humans and the impacts of, on the environment. And it's looking at phenology, looking at changes in, when we say Project Bud Burst it is what it is, when uh, the timing of trees, those leaves bursting for, you know, you have mm -hmm. bud burst, flowers, how has that changed? Keeping track of that over over many years, if we've seen any change um, in the past, uh, you know, 20, 25 mm -hmm. years or whatnot. So mm -hmm. it's another fun program, um, and it's free as well to and participate in that. And great to use with students, I would think. It is, yes, and, and it was, I was thinking about this when I looked at that. We had done a phenology program when I was an educator in parks and recreation, and I wish we would have, it, it was, this was early 2000s. We wouldn't have been onto this, but we would have known about that because it would have really brought in the technology aspect for those students because they were out in that park every month checking where, where are the timing of this plant? Where are these plants at at this yeah, time? Yeah, being able to compare it to students exactly. in New York, exactly. in mm -hmm. Georgia, in right. all different areas would be really powerful. So another one that I, so, you know, we're, we're forestry and natural resources, so a lot right. of our projects our reflect that, yeah. but citizen science is huge, and there's lots of different ways you can approach that. So one that I have tried out and recommend from a different side of things is Galaxy Zoo. Um, uh, has anyone, have you No, but that? I'm going to try it. Uh, yeah. You were telling me about it, and it sounds really interesting. So, so in order to understand how galaxies form, apparently you need to classify them according to different shapes. And so in this citizen science project, it's part of a bigger project that has lots of different kind of components. But if you go to the website, what you'll see is images from Dark Energy Camera Legacy Survey, which is a, from a telescope in Chile. And they have telescope images of distant galaxies. And basically what you do is you look at one and then you kind of answer their questions about its shape, um, different patterns that you might see. And it helps classify all of these you know, millions of images of galaxies that this, this telescope is providing. Uh, so kind of crowdsourcing all mm -hmm. of that uh, data analysis. And they have over 17,000 volunteers. Wow. They have a million <laughs> plus classifications, lots of scientific research that's come out of this, you know, better understanding the universe around us. And the best part of it, in my opinion, is that if you, like me, know nothing about this, you can still go on their website, and within five minutes, you basically know what you're doing. It walks you through it really fast. Mm -hmm. You can do it when you just have five down minutes, and you might be the first person to ever see this galaxy, wow. you know, mm -hmm. which is really uh -huh. kind of exciting oh, to like think that. about. Uh -huh. um, so I think that that's a great one. And then uh, if even if that's too much, there's a different citizen science project called SETI at Home, which is a volunteer computing project, which just means that you kind of donate your computer computer's processing <laughs> powers, you download something onto your computer, and then when your computer is available, it will just spend time analyzing radio signals, searching for signs of extraterrestrial <laughs> intelligence. Oh my goodness. Using your computer, so you don't even have to do anything. You, <laughs> down, you, know, you don't do have to do anything to participate. You download something and <laughs> let your computer do the find, rest. Find the aliens. So, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways mm -hmm. that you could be involved in citizen science projects. Awesome. That one sounds interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it yeah. really does. So lots of opportunities out there, no matter what you like doing or how you like mm -hmm. um, being involved. Great. Well, you've presented us with a lot of great information, and so what would be one or two takeaway items that you would um, like our li listeners to uh, know about citizen science? 
I guess I'd really like to emphasize that you don't have to be an expert. Absolutely. You don't have to be, you know, being paid to be a scientist or have an advanced degree to make really meaningful contributions. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Science is a process and, um, you know, you can use that and you can be a part of that and you can, you know, do whatever it is that makes you excited or benefits uh, you and your community. You know, use the tools around you uh, that are out there and to make it happen. And um, if you are looking for projects or ways to um, get involved in citizen science, we've talked about a few examples. Exactly. But I'd encourage you to go to um, maybe SciStarter, which is a website that has a lot of different citizen science projects. Um, It'll and, have everything that we've yeah. talked about listed on there, right? Mm -hmm. And then And some. then some <laughs> lots more, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anything else? Uh, no, and I, the same if you, when you you mentioned size starter, but also if you if for those who bird, since I'm a birder, mm -hmm. when you go to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, they have a tab for citizen science, and so and that expands out and keeps expanding out because <laughs> there's a lot more, there are many more projects that aren't necessarily bird related but habitat related that you can get involved in. There are too many again, many of those like you said, this is citizen science is great because. Anybody can get involved, no matter our skill level. Um, but the other thing that I think that's wonderful, besides that, is that most of these are free. You know, it, this is something mm -hmm. you can do, and it doesn't really cost anything. It just gets you outdoors observing. Well, not all of them outdoors, but <laughs> many of them outdoors yeah. observing and learning about what's going on around you. Be great family projects. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, well, great. Well, we appreciate Carmen coming in and Lori and Ellen. Thank you so much for coming in today. Um, and if you'd like more information on anything that you've heard on this segment of today's show, you can visit our website, www.fromthewoodsky.org. Now stay tuned for Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. Today we have Lori Thomas, an extension forester with the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and she's going to tell us all about this sound that you hear now. Okay, now tell us, what is that sound? Now that's a sound that you would hear most likely, you wouldn't necessarily be in your backyard, but you might, depending mm -hmm. on where you live. This is gonna be a, uh, as you can tell, it's a bird. Right. Um, and this is one you'll probably hear, you won't maybe see this guy, but you'll hear it far off with that shrieking, that, uh, that to me is just typical of this. This is from a northern flicker, mm -hmm. which is actually one of our woodpeckers oh. that we find here in the state. Um, actually, you'll find it all over the northern um, uh, North America. It is a, a year-round resident here in Kentucky, so this bird will most likely stay here, won't migrate. If they do migrate, flickers uh, just migrate kind of locally, just to where it's a little bit warmer, maybe a little bit um, better food source. But we find flickers, northern flickers here year round. Mm -hmm. So they nest and raise young here and then they stay here all winter as well. Um, but they are one of our uh, one of our woodpeckers. They're kind of a larger bird, but not nearly as large as that pileated woodpecker. And you'll notice when you listen to those to um, the sound or the call, that first part of it actually sounds very much like a pileated woodpecker. Um, but the second part, where you heard the uh, the uh, shriek, I always think of it as a shriek. To me, that's typical of this. That is characteristic of our northern flicker. Um, it is an unusual woodpecker in that a lot of times you will not see them on the trees. If you do see them, they'll be on the edges of the woods or the forest or a trail because they can be ground feeders. They are capable oh. of feeding in a tree. They will eat insects like most woodpeckers do, but they also like to feed on the ground as well. So they're looking for a variety of insects on the ground. Um, they will also in the winter, since they are here year-round residents, they can't eat insects in the winter unless we get a great warm day. They're going to eat um, berries and seeds 
seeds and whatnot. So you'll see them in different kinds of trees. You might see them in a sumac tree, which has those fuzzy red berries and whatnot, eating those berries mm -hmm. farther into winter. Um, but it is one of our woodpeckers. Uh, you might get lucky and see it at your feeder if you've got maybe peanuts out or um, suet. It might come to your feeder for that, but you might also see it on the ground. Um, there's a chance of that, but most likely this is going to be one of those great uh, birds that you're going to hear out in the woods, and if you get lucky, you get to see it. It is a, It's probably one of my favorite birds visually, just the coloration. It's very striking with kind of that the tan background, that taupe background, with mm -hmm. the, and it's got black spotting on it and, and kind of a black collar, and then there'll be red. And, and then when they fly, you've got flashes of color from their underwings. So they're really mm -hmm. pretty, a very pretty bird. So, yeah, it's a great one. Hopefully you'll get to hear one, and hopefully you'll get to see one too if you're out in the woods sometime. I know earlier we were talking about citizen science and they're part of a citizen science thing as well. The, right. These birds are. Exactly. So um, or can be. I guess. Yes, they can be. And I was going to say uh, for those of the, those of you who like to bird and um, there's eBird, which we have mentioned in other citizen science programs. Um, and that's, uh, you can count birds anywhere, anytime. Mm -hmm. Flickers are going to come up on that, of course, because we find them all over North America. Um, but there is one um, event that is coming up, a big citizen science. Actually, I kind of think of it as like the granddaddy of citizen <laughs> science, and that's the Christmas Bird Count, um, which is a, a, a really great program that's put on by the Audubon. Um, society and it's this is I think the 119th year for wow. it um, and it is just what it sounds like it's a Christmas bird count so anytime between um, January um, December 14th of 2018 and January 5th 2019 um, Christmas bird counts will be happening all over North America you can maybe even participate in one of these, but you may go, okay, so what's a Christmas bird count? Right. Exactly. Um, so what am like, I going to do? Why is it called Christmas bird count? Right. So um, it, like I said, is a longstanding program. It's well over 100 years, and it's always been about citizen science. We have, they, from the very beginning, birders were out. These were not scientists. They were out counting birds that they saw in a defined area, and they would submit their data to Audubon. So this has been going on for a really long time. And it was designed as this early winter bird census to see birds have now done their, gone to their wintering grounds to see where those birds are. If they're staying in the same wintering grounds, we're seeing the same abundance and frequency of birds in different areas. And what we found is you're going to see changes. And this is, they've been able to document those changes with this great Christmas bird count. You can, if you're really, you want to find out more, go to Audubon. Christmas bird count, just Google that. It's going to come up. It's going to give you a lot more information. You can even click on there and find out what kind of Christmas bird counts are going on around you um, and how you can participate in that. Because again, it is citizen science. You do not have to be an expert in this at all. If you're here in the central part, right around really Fayette, Jesmond Scott County, um, I would go to the Central Kentucky Audubon Society website because they're the ones who kind of organize the Christmas bird count for Fayette, parts of Jesmond, parts of Scott County. And you can go on there and there's a place on there you can click, say, I'm interested, and send them an email and they'll get back in touch with you. And they'll try to hook you up with, depending on where you live, hook you up with a group that's counting birds near you. And again, anybody can join. And, and I know with Central Kentucky Audubon, what we try to do is if you're an inexperienced birder we will put you in with a group that has experienced birders you won't be the one responsible for collecting all that data you'll get to go out and be an extra set of eyes and ears with that group which is really important and um, because this is bird this is speed birding pretty much mm -hmm. you're going to meet ours is i guess i should start with the one here in for central kentucky is december 15th saturday december 15th and what we do, um, I have a, an area that I take care of. We all meet up actually at a Kroger parking lot. We hop in one vehicle. We could, if you've got a bigger group, maybe you'll take two of them. And you're going to drive to your first spot location. So this isn't, you're not walking over a 15-mile area or anything mm -hmm. like that. You're driving and doing spotting, getting out. We do a lot of horse farms in our area, so we have access to those horse farms. Get out and do spot counts. And it is at speed counting. What am I seeing <laughs> right here? Now let's move down the road and count there. We make time to stop for hot chocolate and coffee because it is. it was cold last year. But it's a great way. I met people I'd never met before because um, last year was the first time I participated in it. And it was a lot of fun. Um, we have collect, we collect all that data, and then we got together and had a big potluck afterwards. And 
shared all that data and then it all got submitted to Audubon. And um, so we were enjoying one another's company. We got out to see areas of, for me, Jesmond County I hadn't seen before. So uh, it's it was a lot of fun. And I, if you're interested in birds or you're just interested in citizen science, this is one that's coming up quick. Uh, go to Central Kentucky Audubon, click on their Christmas bird count and get yourself, you know, paired up with a, a, a a group of counters somewhere near you and yeah it's a lot of fun it was a great way to spend a Saturday okay so uh, another bird that you might see um, and as part of this Christmas Uh count um, we need to uh, listen to that sound all right Okay, now tell us what that was. Isn't that great? Okay, so this is a real, this is a very small songbird. Um, more than likely, if you're not, you can see these at your feeders, okay? And um, it's in the finch family. It's called a pine siskin. Um, and it's a great, it's a, for, I had one, I had actually had about nine of them at my feeder the other day. I was super excited. Wow. I've never had them at my feeders before. But it is a very small songbird. It they tend to they breed and their summering grounds are up in Canada, mm-hmm. um, and now they've moved south. Um, and you know where it's a little warmer, there's a more food source and um, a little you know a little more area. They are um, considered somewhat unpredictable. Uh, you will you might in Fayette County right now we're seeing a whole bunch of them. Next year we may not see hardly any. Oh, okay. That's the way their populations kind of are. They move around. They're kind of erratic. Um, But a really wonderful little songbird, like I said, it's in the finch family. It's smaller than a goldfinch, which is very small. Anyway, but it has a very narrow, thin bill. It eats thistle. So if you put thistle out at your bird feeder, you might get to see them this year. Pretty stripes, very wheezy, as you could tell by the call there. Um, And that's what, like I said, you usually, if you're going to be out in the woods, because it is a small bird, you're probably going to hear them before you see them. And uh, a lot of times people talk about their uh, a watch winding. Of their, when you listen to their call, you kind of heard that, a watch winding. And they kind of, mm-hmm. the males will kind of muddle these things all together and kind of skip around. Um, and sometimes you hear that churry notes, those tree notes. There. I'm not good at doing bird calls. But, <laughs> but it is, it's a great little bird. And, and it's exciting when you get to see it because it's not, you don't see it every year here. Mm-hmm. Like I said, their uh, populations tend to be a, a little erratic where they end up each year. But it is, it's a wonderful little um, small songbird that may come to your feeder or you may see it if you go out in the Christmas bird count or even the great American backyard bird count, which doesn't happen until February. Okay. So if people want more information on the Christmas bird count? I would go to the Audubon, um, just Audubon, and that's National Audubon, and you mm-hmm. can find out information there. That's kind of big picture. Um, if you were, you're were you here in the Central Kentucky area and you wanted more information or you think you want to join, go to Central Kentucky Audubon Society's website page, um, and they have a thing on Christmas bird count. They also list several uh, events that, are, that are, will be happening, other bird walks that they do throughout the winter, different places like the cemetery, Raven Run, Flora Cliff. They meet on Saturdays and you can go out and some of these are really experienced birders and it's a good way to kind of dip your toe in there if you think you're interested in birding and learn for some really um, experienced birders out there. But you can find out information about the Christmas bird count there as well. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you for joining us today. Um, You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky. If you have any questions about things that you heard on today's show, please visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned each Thursday from 10 to 11 a.m. for another edition of From the Woods, Kentucky. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at wrfl.fm. And, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to wrfl.fm slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.